You can get the next episode of Sworn right now on the TuneIn app. On TuneIn, new episodes of Sworn are available one week early. Download TuneIn today and listen for free. Place your left hand on the Bay of Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. We the jury find the defendant not guilty. Protests continued this weekend in Ferguson and around the country. Quit resisting. You're under your It makes no sense. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Judge, you are the last line of reason in this case. Every one of us took an oath of office and we're sworn to uphold the Constitution. Tenderfoot TV in Atlanta, this is Sworn. I'm your host, Philip Holloway. I wanted to take a second to tell you guys about this new subscription box service called Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer enables you to dive deep into the mind of a serial killer by piecing together clues to an ongoing murder mystery each month. The Hunt a Killer storyline sets you up as a volunteer to be a pen pal to a patient in a treatment facility for the mentally disturbed. Your pen pal will confide in you the details of his twisted desires through eerie letters, objects, codes, and clues that uncover his true motives. It's the perfect challenge for someone who loves poring over creepy codes, ciphers, and clues and wants to put their crime sleuthing skills to the test. The company only accepts 500 new memberships each week, so make sure you apply ASAP. You can apply for membership online at huntakiller.com. If you're approved for membership, you'll receive a private link to subscribe. To help support our show, Hunt a Killer has offered a 10% discount for our listeners. Use the code SWORN and get 10% off. That's SWORN for 10% off at Hunt a Killer. In Turner County, if somebody's got a problem with you, they're probably going to go up and, and say it to you, but it's not necessarily going to lead them to kill an entire family and burn their house down. In the last episode, I spoke to John Dawes, a cold case expert who felt that greed and money are almost always the motivation for murder. Also, the majority of murders are committed by someone or a group who knows the victims personally. He said that if this were his case in his hands, he would typically start with the family. Who had something to gain here? Also, because Melissa was eight months pregnant and nearly ready to give birth, he said he would definitely look into the father of her child. In just a minute, Meredith goes to talk to Ben Baker at the Wiregrass newspaper in Ashford. But before we get to that, there was a strange development in the case. Some very sensitive information came our way. We cannot share all of it with you, but we'd like to play you a short clip. Why am I interested in it? Were the alibi that night for the prime suspect in the murder case? Do you understand what I'm telling you? They were his only alibi. Early on in our investigation, we received this phone call about the Weidman murders. By all accounts, it seemed credible. The source was close enough to the case that the story made sense but disconnected enough that there was no reason for the individual to lie. We'll get back to this later, but for now, let's go to the Wiregrass. It was Fire Ant Festival weekend. I don't remember the year, but that was, of course, the whole talk of the town the next morning. That's when I found out about it. I was said the Weidmans were murdered and the house they were in was burned down. My impression was I didn't have one. I was just too numb to think about it. I was too stunned. This is Ben Baker. He's been the editor of the newspaper for 23 years. When do you think it set in? Gradually over the course of the next few months. It took a while for me to realize that Tommy Joe was gone. The other ones were gone. I was more of a friend of Tommy Joe than his daughter and his wife. And it was Fire Ant Festival weekend. 
and I'm the general run around guy at the festival. Something needs to do it, and they holler at me to do it. So I really didn't have time to process it until the week after the festival, because when we got done with the festival, then I had to both cover the festival and cover the Weidman case for the newspaper. All my energies at that time were directed to getting everything into the paper. And when you've been a reporter for as long as I have, you learn to distance yourself emotionally from the subject at hand because you got a job to do. You just get it put out. And then the next week, yeah, that's when he hit me. He was gone. You don't seem very scared. Ben's office is in the center of Ashburn, but the streets outside aren't exactly bustling. As we said, it's a very quiet place. There's an eclectic mix of stuffed animal heads mounted on the walls and surfaces inside of his office. There's also stacks and stacks of papers, periodicals, and books. You can tell Ben's been in the business for a long time. When you're in my line of business, you need to know things that don't get published. And people tell me things. I'm the newspaper editor. I'm also a minister here. And for some reason, people just tell me stuff. And... Depending on how and why and when they tell me, it can be confidential or it can be passed along. And as I tell people, if you tell me something as a reporter and it's important enough, eventually it's going in the paper. But it does have to be properly timed. So I need to know things so that I can look for stuff and keep some things out of the paper that simply don't need to be there. Some people are going to say, we've got a right to know this. Yeah, you do. Is your right to know outweighing the good to the community. In my eyes, Ben is somewhat of an expert on Turner County. Being the editor of the local newspaper, it's his business to know what's going on, and he's clearly very well connected. I asked him who he'd talked to in regards to the Weidman case. Talked to the EMS director, I talked to the fire chief, and the sheriff's department. Was there anyone that wasn't very willing to talk? or They shared with me on the record everything they could talk about at the time, and... Since then, there have been many more conversations. Many more conversations as in information that wasn't disclosed before or wasn't known before? Well, there's been some stuff that wasn't known that day that we talked about, and there's been some stuff that, I mean, why do you need to know the caliber of gun they were killed with? That's irrelevant. I asked Ben about the general public feelings in Turner County regarding the Weidman case. There's some people that swear they know who did it. You ask them. They'll tell you the individual's name. Well, how do you know this? He's just that kind of a person. You've got some evidence? Let's talk about it. You said his car was parked there, or his truck, or his motorcycle, or his bicycle was parked there that night? Okay, we got something to work with. You say he was riding around that night over in that neighborhood? A little bit more tenuous. You just say you just simply know because he's that kind of a person? No, you don't know that. Ben's right about this. Innocent until proven guilty. And without evidence, people can speculate all day. Bodies, and that they were shot, and there was some talk about tire tracks, but there was also the issue of all the public safety there, so they weren't sure if the tire tracks were going to be any good. Where were the tire tracks? They're in the yard. Up the driveway or just like in the... All I can tell you is right there at the property. I am not certain if there was a motive or not just beyond, hey, here's a house, let's go see who's here and rob them and kill them. You're going to say, that just simply doesn't happen. Oh, yeah, hell, it does, too. You talk to the sheriff's department and the police department. We have smash and grab robberies frequently because we're on the interstate. This might sound plausible, but to be candid, there's no evidence that this was a burglary. Local law enforcement never suggested that they had any reason to believe that it was. We had a gentleman who went missing. They found his car. He popped up in a pond a week later. That's still a mysterious death. We asked about what the chief of fire had personally reported to Ben. What did he describe to you about the scene, other than it being horrific? He said it was bad and the house was burned completely down. By the time they got there, it was fully engulfed. You look around the room in here. You see my fallow deer. You see my elk. Right. On the other side, I got a bison. I got two little bucks over there I killed with one shot. There's the buffalo skull. I know people that can come walk through that door right there and look at this and have a panic attack and pass out on the floor. You're not prepared to see this kind of scene. I don't care who you are. We've got firemen who are in the military, who are in Vietnam, who are in other places, and they've seen bodies blown to pieces. You're not prepared to see that kind of thing. I don't care who you are, unless you're a complete psychopath and you have no 
human emotion, emotional connection, you just don't have any empathy whatsoever, then you look on it every day and say, huh, I'm ready for a ham sandwich for lunch, I think. We asked Ben who owned the property now that the house had been burned down. He told us that, to his latest knowledge, it still belonged to the remaining members of the Weidman family. So we asked who that was. Charles Henry is here and his son, Chip. I think they both, Charles Henry I know lives in Rebecca with Diane, and I think Chip lives in Rebecca or Fitzgerald. Are they still working in the community? Chip's an insurance salesman, Charles Henry. I don't know if he's still working or not in insurance or if he retired. I don't remember. About how many times do you think you wrote about the Weidman case? Up to about a dozen, I believe. When's the last time you personally wrote something? It's been several years since I've written about it. Christy used to work for the Old Silver Star, would write about it every year on the anniversary, but she was related to the family. So unless you're connected to it, you never think about it. But there's nothing else to report. What are you going to say? Well, it's still under investigation. Yeah, we know that. All that's going to happen by me reporting on it now is remind the remaining family that this is unsolved and it's going to renew the pain they have. Is the public's right to know that it's not solved more important than not making that family hurt anymore? It ain't been solved. The minute it gets solved, the minute they arrest somebody, we're talking banner headline in that week's newspaper and breaking news, I may put out a special edition. Sheriff's Department has got a pretty high, and the police department got a pretty high rate on solving cases. But as our former sheriff, Wesley Fiveash, said, a law enforcement man ain't no better than the information he gets. The only way this thing is going to be solved, to my way of thinking, is if somebody comes forward and says, hey, I know about this, here's some information, or somebody's on their deathbed and they confess. We've exhausted the physical evidence. Fire is an awesome way to cover your tracks. I had qualms about even talking to you guys for this podcast thing, but I have to weigh, again, respect for the families versus their wanting to get some closure on this. Y'all reach a much different audience than I do. I can write about this freaking Weidman case every week for the rest of my life if it's not solved, and it's going to be going to the same people. Y'all have a very different audience than me. You might can reach somebody I can't. That's why I'm even talking to you today, because you might can reach somebody who knows something. If I thought you couldn't, I said, I say you can't talk to you. You got four people dead. We need some closure here, folks. Somebody needs to be held accountable for this. If the person who did this keeps their mouth shut and takes it to the grave, never be solved in this life. The person who did it, talks about it, we can solve it. Of course, in addition to the local newspaper, the case caught the eye of larger media outlets such as local television stations. Even though this was a small town crime, it really was a bone chilling triple homicide. And so it got coverage. As it turns out, Rebecca is not really far from Albany, Georgia. Albany, Georgia has a larger media market and it includes a television station known as WALB TV. I've got a friend at WALB. Cade Fowler is an anchor and reporter, and as it turns out, my friend Cade has covered the Weidman case very closely and has reported on it many times. I was actually looking on the uh, the GBI's website, and they had uh, a list of cold cases on there. And uh, scrolling through, and, and on there it will list the, the location where the crime occurred. And I saw Rebecca pop up, and I said, Rebecca, Rebecca. I said, that's in, that's in Turner County. And this was like in 2012, I believe, when I, when I did this story, uh, 2012, 2013. And I was like, how, how did I not know about this? And it had sort of, you know, not hit my radar. I guess I just didn't know about it and I heard a lot of talk about it. And so that's when I started looking into it and started making some phone calls, try to, you know, pick back up on it and see if there was any new leads we could track down on, on our end in terms of trying to get some people to talk. My name is Kate Fowler. I'm a reporter and anchor at uh, WALB. I started there in, in 2007, covered a lot of crime and uh, you know, specialized in reporting on, on cold cases and stuff because there's a number of them in South Georgia. 
is there still a lot of public interest this, what, 15 years later? Actually, there is. And, you know, I'll, I'll give I'll give credit there to to the sheriff, Andy Hester. I mean, he is he has kept this out in the in the public's eye, you know, more so than than anyone else that's served in that office. And I think there's been since this happened, there were two sheriffs in office prior to Sheriff Hester. He's made a couple of um, held a pu- couple of press conferences just in the past year or so uh, asking for more tips on this case. You have three people who are dead. You know, by all accounts, these were just people who were, you know, good small town folk who minded their own business. They didn't deserve to die. I mean, this young lady, she was pregnant at the time. So basically you have four, four lives, essentially, you know, that were lost in this case. And they, they shouldn't be forgotten. So what do we know publicly, if you can summarize that and give us background on the case and what we do know and then what we don't know and what we still need to know? Rebecca, you know, is a small town, probably only a few hundred people that live there. It's quiet. People keep to themselves. And this house where the Wiedemans live was off of Highway 112. And it's pretty much one of those locations where you you got to be going through it to go through it. You know, it's just out there in farmland. And so there was a, a truck driver that was driving down the road in the middle of the night. He ends up seeing, you know, flames coming off the side of the road, calls 911. They respond to it. It's a, it's a house fire. So their home is engulfed in flames, and they finally, you know, put out the fire. And then, you know, when the firefighters are going through and they're digging through the ashes, they realize that, you know, they're not dealing with just a you know, house fire right here. They're dealing with a homicide. They found all three victims inside, Tommy Joe, Deborah, Melissa, and very soon after determined that they had been shot to death. And then someone torched the house to destroy the evidence. Did they find evidence of any accelerant? I've asked that question. I don't think they really went into detail about what was actually used to, to start the fire. I think that's probably something that they're, they're going to keep to themselves. At least I know I asked that question, but you know, it's been a few years, but I, I don't think that they specifically explained what was used to start the fire. What else have they kept to themselves? I don't know. I mean, at this point, you know, I'm not sure. They've been, you know, fairly open, you know, about getting some information out. I mean, we do know that they were all, you know, executed there in the home, that they were shot. And they have told us that much. And the other thing that they did, and I will say this, is, you know, despite the fact that so much was destroyed in that fire, there was really no evidence to suggest that anything was taken from the home. I think they were able to gather enough evidence to determine, you know, this wasn't probably just some random home invasion. Was there any neighbors nearby that might have seen something? Uh, Not that I know of. I mean, I think this house was was really just kind of off the road. I mean, you you know South Georgia well, Phil. I mean, you've you've been through there. You drive along those country roads and, and Highway 112, you know, going through Turner County is about as country as it gets. I mean, you go farmland, farmland, trees and then occasionally you'll see a house off to the side and the house of course you know was destroyed it's been raised since then there's nothing there but uh not a lot of neighbors i mean i think you had to actually go up a driveway to get there the big question that everyone is asking is uh whether they think that it was someone local that did this is it someone in the community is it someone who you know knew the family tommy joe he was the uh, he was the tax assessor in Turner County, and Deborah owned a uh, a bridal shop in Ashburn. So these were people that, you know, were fairly well-known and and fairly well-liked in the community. To my knowledge, they had had no enemies. And and, I mean, a tax assessor is probably not going to win a popularity contest, you know, when it comes to elected officials or county officials or whatnot. But no one that that I've talked to, you know, over the years of just talking to people back and forth and even covering this story, everyone said, you know, he was he was a good guy. I honestly believe that he didn't have any enemies. And even so, in Turner County, if somebody's got a problem with you, they're probably going to go up and and say it to you, but it's not necessarily going to lead them to kill an entire family and burn their house down. When's the last time you spoke to Sheriff Hester about this case? I talked to Sheriff Hester, you know, a couple of days ago. What did he have to say about it? He is really done a good job in terms of, I think, keeping this case in the public eye. I will say that about him. He is, um, 
you know, Phil, you've lived in South Georgia. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know how it is down here. There's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of bureaucracy. But he is really one of those sheriffs that I think you can go and sit down and talk to. And I'm not just being a cheerleader here for Sheriff Hester, but anytime I've ever needed to reach out to him, he's been available. In fact, when I set up this story, uh, I think he had just gotten in office and he actually came into office after another the previous sheriff was arrested for stealing marijuana from the evidence locker and giving it to a church member that he knew had cancer. So that's how the sheriff before him ended up getting out of office. So didn't have any contact with that guy. So Sheriff Hester comes in and, you know, when I called him and talked to him, he opened his office to me. We were able to sit down and have a one-on-one about this case. And he also brought in Agent Collins, the case agent at the time who was, you know, on top of this case for, you know, for several years. And, you know, we sat down and talked about this at length. And, you know, you don't always get that from a lot of sheriffs. Based on some folks I've worked with, I applaud him for his efforts. I really do. Did he offer to show you any of the evidence that they did have? They actually gave me more information than than I thought they would. Uh, You know, I think that there's certain boundaries they don't want to cross. I get it. I understand that. But to the point of telling me everything that they possibly could without jeopardizing any sort of sensitive evidence that, you know, could mess up their case, they gave me as much as, as I could have asked for at that point. It's pretty well known, you know, around Turner County that somebody there knows something. This is a small town in South Georgia. Triple homicides just don't happen every day. They do sometimes. But it is very, very rare to say that triple homicide is going to happen in the middle of the night in Rebecca, where probably the only 911 call they get at three o'clock in the morning might be a cow loose in the road or car hitting a deer to say that someone just randomly stopped in this house. Probably not likely. Someone in Turner County probably knows who did this. I'm reading from an August 18th, 2005 item on the website for WALB TV, and it says, ex-Ashburn cop, comma, deputy arrested in East Georgia. And it goes on to say, a suspect in an unsolved Turner County triple homicide is arrested for rape near Savannah. And that is referencing then 31-year-old Jason Walker. What do we know about Jason Walker? The answer that I got when I was looking into this, you know, several years ago was that they they didn't find any evidence to indicate that he had anything to do with it. You know, I I know that that he was one of the individuals that, that they looked at. And I do recall that story now that you mention it. But I think, you know, at least to this point, he had been ruled out. How far along in her pregnancy was Melissa Weidman at the time she was murdered, do you know? Yeah, she was eight months pregnant. So, I mean, she was she was due to have that child very soon. Weeks after this happened, she would have had a child and Tommy Joe and Deborah would have been grandparents. Do we know or has it ever been released who the father of the baby was? That I don't know. The news article references him as a person of interest, quote, in a March 2002 triple homicide in Turner County. He's a former Ashburn policeman and Turner County Sheriff's deputy. It says Walker's former girlfriend, Melissa Weideman, who was pregnant, and her parents, Tommy Joe and Deborah, were murdered in their home. There's been some persons of interest that have come up, but that's just in terms of investigators interviewing these individuals who either knew the Wiedemans or, you know, in some way connected to them. I reached out to both sides of the family. I I called, I tried to reach out to the Wiedemann side, Tommy Joe's family. I didn't hear anything back from them. The only family member that I have been able to, to contact and, you know, speak to me on this was. We had to censor this name for privacy reasons. It will be mentioned just like this a few more times in the series, but we'll explain more later. In the 15 years since the Weidman murders occurred, 
There's been lots of things that have been discussed in the media, lots of interviews, but the Weidman side of the family has, for the most part, stayed silent. However, one name from the other side of the family has come up, and it's come up several times. Based on what I could find in the mainstream media, there's only been one widely suggested person of interest in this case, and that is Jason Walker. But after 15 years, law enforcement hasn't been able to find anything linking Jason Walker to the Weidman murders. So the question is, did Jason Walker have something to do with this and cover his tracks? Or could there be someone else out there that is responsible for the Weidman's murders? I wanted to take a minute to tell you guys about my favorite meal delivery service, HelloFresh. HelloFresh wants to make cooking fun so that you can focus on the whole experience, not just the final plate. You can currently get a classic box, a veggie box, or a family box. Customers can order three, four, or five different meals per week designed for either two or four people, and there are new recipes created every single week. HelloFresh sources the freshest ingredients measured to the exact quantities needed so there's no food waste, and guess what? They employ two full-time registered dietitians on staff who review each recipe to ensure that it is nutritionally balanced. HelloFresh is now offering light autumn meals and has just introduced breakfast options And this is all at less than $10 a meal, people. You cannot beat that with a stick. My favorites right now are the pan-seared duck breast, the mushroom gravy chicken, and the steak and nectarine salad. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and enter promo code SWORN30. Again, that's HelloFresh.com, promo code SWORN30. Other than the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or the GBI, The Turner County Sheriff's Office is the law enforcement agency otherwise responsible for investigating the Weidman case. But here's the thing about the Turner County Sheriff's Office. Since the Weidmans were murdered, there's been four different sheriffs holding office in that county. And that's really unusual because, especially in South Georgia, once an incumbent sheriff takes office, they generally don't lose elections unless something happens. So I want to give you a rundown of who the four sheriffs were and then go back and give you some details that I found to be fascinating. In 2002, when the Weidmans were murdered, the sheriff was a man named Randy Kendrick. Sheriff Kendrick held office until 2008 when he lost his re-election bid to a man named Roy Wiley. Roy Wiley was at that time the chief of police in a small town called Sycamore, Georgia. Sheriff Wiley took office on January 1st, 2009. Barely halfway through his term, Sheriff Wiley resigned from office and later pled guilty to the felony criminal offense of violating his oath of office. This had to do with tampering with evidence, specifically about marijuana that he removed from the evidence locker and gave away to somebody. That brings us to the third sheriff since 2002. That person's name was Charles Dean. He had been Sheriff Wiley's chief deputy. He was appointed by the probate judge to be the acting sheriff until current Sheriff Andy Hester could be reelected in a special election to fill the remaining term of Sheriff Wiley. So I wanted to go back and take a closer look at the campaign where Sheriff Kendrick lost to Sheriff Wiley. In a July 31, 2008 media report from WALB News in Albany, Georgia, Roy Wiley says he's unhappy with the way the Sheriff's Department has been handled, specifically referencing their budget. And here's the thing. He says he wants to reopen unsolved death cases. So, did Sheriff Kendrick lose his office because the Weidman murders hadn't been solved? It sure looks that way because, to my knowledge... There weren't any other unsolved death cases pending in July of 2008. Certainly none as high profile or well known as the Weidman murders. And according to the Tifton Gazette, in December of 2005, Sheriff Kendrick said that officials had recently met at the GBI office in Perry to take another cohesive look at the murders of the Weidman family. But listen to this very interesting direct quote. Sheriff Kendrick says, The investigation has never stopped, but I want them to concentrate on it more than they have been doing. They can take the case and look into it some more and follow up on some things. 
So it appears that Sheriff Kendrick is being somewhat critical himself of the GBI. There were two more very interesting quotes by Sheriff Kendrick. Quote, they agreed that even though the case is still being worked, an increased concentration is needed. I wanted to regroup everybody and put a good steady pace to it and to look at things from a different angle. So this makes it clear to me that in 2005, Sheriff Kendrick really did want this investigation to move forward. He really did want the GBI to work harder. He was pushing for the Weidman case to be solved. I've been in law enforcement for 39 years. I've been the elected sheriff for almost 25. I've been very fortunate to have a career centered here in northeast Georgia. I reached out to my friend Sheriff Scott Berry, the elected sheriff of Oconee County, Georgia, just outside of Athens, Georgia. If you're the perpetrator of a crime, I think they view arson as a destruction of any trace evidence or any, or maybe even a body or maybe even a gun or, or whatever weapon was used in the uh, murder case. It, they think it may destroy blood evidence and things like that, that may be stains in a floor, stains in a carpet. So fires can be used to destroy those things. It doesn't work all the time. That's the thing. A lot of times, a lot of that trace evidence is still there. It may be hard to find. You may have to dig to find it. You may have to move a lot of burned wood and furniture out and really dig down to the floorboards to get what you need. But to destroy evidence is a good reason for an arson. Burning is rarely, rarely, rarely complete as people think it is. It is very unusual for particularly a body, for instance, to be burned completely where there is nothing left. That fire has to be hot, has to be hot for a long time, and you're not going to find that in a typical house fire. You have to have additional accelerants, additional fuel to destroy a body, for instance. Now, can it destroy some blood stains on a wall? Sure, of course it can. But is it going to get rid of all the evidence in a murder case? People might think it will, but fire is not that good at doing that, no. It can be successful in making it difficult or impossible or to destroy evidence. That in and of itself won't stop law enforcement from solving a crime. Hopefully, you've got other leads, other informants in the community, other leads you can follow to help you still solve the crime. But will it destroy physical evidence? Of course it will. You've got to get people out to talk to everyone that knows your victim. You've got to do a complete victimology. You've got to go back into the victim's background. Who are their friends? Who are their enemies? Who are their cousins? Who just got out of prison? You've got to start with a real big circle and work that circle inward. And usually, statistics will bear out that usually a murder victim knows the murderer. So you've got to look first off at everyone that knows, knows your victims. Once you get your victims identified, you've got to start looking at everyone they have contact with, everyone that may have a reason or may have fabricated a reason to commit a murder case. And you work outward from there. You've got to start somewhere. Those first few hours of talking to people, when you can get them when they're emotional, when you can get them when they're willing to talk to you, are so vitally important in a case like that. I asked him about how important it was to establish a motive in a crime like this. Ultimately, you want that motive to show a jury why this person was murdered. A jury of ordinary people sitting there in a jury box, hearing only what evidence they're allowed to hear, they want to know why this happened. They want to know the under, underlying reason for that crime. And ultimately, although it is not an element of the crime, and you're right, we don't have to prove motive. It is good when we can prove motive. Not only does it help you work toward suspects, but it, a jury wants that information. A jury that doesn't have a motive is going to sit back in that jury room and you're going to have a hard time getting a conviction. You want to be able to put your suspect in the area of the victim at the time of the crime. There's so many different ways to do that now with technology. You can do it with a phone. You can do it with surveillance cameras. And you can do it with eyewitnesses in a small town like the town I live in. People know each other. People will recognize somebody's truck, somebody's car, particularly when you live in a rural area. I mean, everybody knows what everybody else drives. They know when the car doesn't belong down there. So 
But you've got to get that information early. You can't wait 10 years to get that information. You want that information while it's fresh, while it's actionable, and while there's something you can do with it. I asked him how he felt about dealing with outside agencies during his investigations. Was it helpful or was it more detrimental to the case? I've got a lot of feelings about bringing in outside agencies. Don't turn over anything to them. We have something for them to do. We don't turn over the responsibility for actively working that case to another agency. Uh, another agency comes in to assist us. If there's nothing for them to assist us doing, then we don't need them there. We take responsibility for our cases. I'm the sheriff of Oconee County. I was elected to work these cases. I was elected to keep the people safe. It's my constitutional duty. It's my responsibility. And I don't delegate that to any other agency. I never turn a case over to another agency. I never will, never have, and that's just not going to happen. I have a hard time even thinking of a reason why somebody would do that. Obviously, if you have a case, if a sheriff is given a case that involves a county commissioner or someone they have to do business with on a regular basis, they may turn that over to another agency. There may be some other political reason why you want to turn a case over. If you don't think it's solvable, or, and you want to have somebody to shift the blame to, you can always say, well, listen, I called the GBI. They can't solve the case either. And that gives a chief or a sheriff some political cover. I can see circumstances where you'd have a parallel investigation with the GBI. I'd have to be faced with that circumstance, but I would take the lead in that investigation. I would be responsible for that investigation. I might let the GBI come in and help me with that, but again... A case like that in my county, I think that we would be more likely to solve it than the GBI would because we know the people that live here. I have 95 employees. At least one of them knows the victim. It would be impossible for me to have a case like that where no one that worked for me didn't know any of the victims or their family. You bring the GBI in for a very specific reason and not to hand them the case file. Traditionally, a lot of people that will talk to a deputy sheriff or to the sheriff, someone they know, won't talk to somebody they don't know, won't talk to somebody that flashes a state badge or a federal badge. Some people are just funny about who they talk to, and they want to talk to their sheriff. They know the sheriff. They elected the sheriff. Either maybe they ran against him. Maybe they voted against him, but they still know him. And they're going to talk to one of these local deputy sheriffs or one of these local peace officers who live in that county, who they see at church, who they see at the grocery store, they're going to want to talk to them, not an employee from somewhere else. I have 95 total employees, and I think the GBI has about 150, 160, 170 agents that are working statewide. Now, that doesn't include support staff, the GCIC, their computer people. It doesn't include a lot of things, but that includes agents. I don't think they have many more than that if they have any more than that. And it's just not a big agency. They don't have a lot of people to throw at a problem. If we determine we have an arson, we would make the decision at that point whether we want the GBI crime scene people to come collect evidence to prove the arson. Again, we're talking about a very specific mission for the GBI. I'm not pick, just picking up. This is any kind of outside agency. Again, I accepted the responsibility when I put my name on the ballot to be the sheriff of Oconee County. And with that came the duty and the authority and the responsibility for me to take these cases to their logical conclusion. I can ask for help from the FBI, the GBI, the state patrol, the game warden, the fire marshal, the coroner, the medical examiner, the department of corrections. I can ask for help from any number of our state partners. But I never relinquish a case that belongs to the Oconee County Sheriff's Office. I would definitely need the assistance to work a crime scene where you have a homicide. There's no question in my mind. I would definitely need somebody to come in and help me work that crime scene. I'm fortunate now that I have my own crime scene tech. But the GBI has always done a great job working crime scenes. And they've done it all over the state of Georgia. And they've done it for me many times. That's the value of working a crime scene. You only get one chance to do it right. And you want to make sure when you do it, you do it right. But you don't quit. That's what you don't do. You don't quit. 
you want to get that case, you get it back out, you look at it and get a fresh set of eyes on it. Look at that evidence, all that evidence in a new light and go back and do those interviews again. Go back and find out, hey, you know, we tried to talk to this guy three times and nobody ever actually talked to him. Well, let's go talk to him. There's going to be something in that case file that's been missed. And you've got to go back and follow up on that. Because they might not call you with what they were told a year ago. But if you go and ask them, they might tell you they heard something at the beauty parlor a year ago that might help you solve that case. Do you know what the average property loss is from just one home break-in? $2,316. Think of it, folks. One burglary, over $2,000. If you tally up all of the burglaries in this country, it's even worse. The total loss is in the billions. With so much to lose, I'm telling you, it's as important as ever to protect your home. Try it with Simply Safe Home Security. Simply Safe protects every door and window in your home. Simply Safe system is completely wireless, so you can set it up yourself without drilling any holes in your wall. And you'll have professional alarm monitoring around the clock, ready to send the police. That's just 15 bucks a month. With Simply Safe, you can be sure that your home and your things are protected. So please go to simplysafe.com slash sworn and get a special 10% discount when you order today. Or if you want this security system right away, visit your local Best Buy store. You'll have this in your home and your home will be protected by midnight tonight. That's simplysafe.com slash sworn for 10% off. Simplysafe.com slash sworn. <laughs> Which table? Okay. Walker's Barbecue Pet is a long, narrow barbecue joint in Sycamore, Georgia, right off the railroad tracks. We visited after lunchtime. There was no one inside, but the TV in the corner played an old black and white film. A man named Frosty greeted us. I don't know what I'm telling you. Earlier in the week, I would called Frosty to ask if we could speak to him. We'd been told he was a local and a family friend that might be willing to talk to us about the case. I'm Mike Hitman, better known as Frosty. This is Walker's Barbecue in Sittenmore, Georgia. And I was born, raised here. I've been knowing his a new devil all her life. She grew up, we lived next door to each other. I've been knowing Dom Joe since he was part of 16. And I knew uh, anything thing to her thing. What's the other thing? The daughter, Melissa? Yeah, Melissa. All her life, we had a place in Ferndana that they had a place in Ferndana. She always come over and see us. I mean, we've been knowing we were real good friends, and that's basically all I can tell you. <laughs> they were well liked. I mean, they, they were real low profile. They liked to go out and eat and go to parties and stuff like that. They weren't wild by no means, and um, they liked to go to Ferndana. Fernandina Beach is in Florida, where Tommy Joe Weidman's mother had a house. That's where she was the night they were killed. I was outside cooking, and it was four or five o'clock in the morning. And my wife was real good friends with Tommy Joe. She's passed away. And she called me, and she was real upset. I think it upset the whole, everybody. I mean, and then not finding out who done it or why. It's hard to believe. Somebody was just coming by and done that. Whoever done it had it planned for some reason. I do not know. People talk about it all the time. It ain't went away at all. I mean, you might go a month from not hearing it. You hear it some more. What Frosty said conflicted with what we'd been told at the Wiregrass. It seemed that some portion of the town may have wanted to move on from the tragedy, but others simply couldn't let it go. We talked to the sheriff, all three sheriffs about it. There have been three sheriffs since it's happened. They don't say much. They say, they don't, you know, we're working on it. We don't know. They know more than what we do. Dabo's family has been trying hard to find out 
There's no telling how much money he spent trying to find hard investigators going around talking to people like y'all are. That's a person you need to talk to. He told us that he's still alive and last he knew, living in Fitzgerald. He has tried hard. He can tell. He part sit down and talk to you for two or three hours. We then asked Frosty about the family members alive on the Weidman side. His brother, his wife, Diane Weidman, she's a real good friend of mine. I don't know Charles Hemmer that good. And there's a nephew. The nephew he's referring to is Charles Henry Weidman, also known as Chip. His father was Tommy Joe's brother. Somebody, somebody done it. One person, two people, three people, four. We tried reaching out to Chip, but got no answer. Next time on Sworn. People sort of say if in Irwin County you get bought off, in Turner County you get killed off. We've learned a lot about how this case appeared in the public eye, and we've learned a little bit about how it was handled. And more than one person has told us that the scene seemed to have been cleared very quickly. We'll continue our investigation by getting to the center of local Turner County law enforcement. We'll also talk to someone that, besides the GBI, may know this case the best. Next time on Sworn. New episodes of Sworn will be available seven days early on TuneIn. Download the TuneIn app and listen for free. Hear new shows from other great podcasts on TuneIn before anywhere else. You can find our new episodes at TuneIn.com slash Sworn. That's TuneIn.com backslash Sworn.